but it was just one of those things when you have an inner impulse, this inner knowing that says, you know, it's time. And I was really trying to honor this newfound growth where I was listening to myself and I was honoring my needs. This is Girl Take Note, a podcast for women who are looking to turn their dreams into reality. Hey, Christina, welcome to the Girl Take Note podcast. How are you? I'm doing great. How are you doing? I am doing good. Thank you so much for coming on. Excited to um, have this conversation. I think it's going to be really good. I always love to interview entrepreneurs and kind of get their story behind their brands. And for you, I know you started out with um, founding Eon Health. And so kind of walk. Is it? So sorry. I just want to, I always just want to be really careful here. I didn't found it. I was like employee number two and helped build it from the ground up. So not the founder. Okay. But eventual co-CEO and all of that. Eventually co-CEO. Okay. Mm-hmm. That's, I stand corrected. Um, kind of talk, well, kind of walk, let's go through, let's say this. Kind of walk us through your background in terms of being a part of Eon Health, you know, how you help revolutionize the data management for healthcare and kind of walk us through that and where you are today. Yeah, absolutely. Well, first of all, thank you for having me. It's such an yeah. honor and I am really grateful for the opportunity. Um, you know, I, my dad was an entrepreneur, small businessman. So I always thought I would be an entrepreneur. Um, started my first business when I was in second grade, a girlfriend and I were making these little pins out of clay that we were selling at a restaurant and yeah. making five or $6 a pin. And it was great. You know, that was big money in the eighties yeah. and I uh, loved it. And then we had a little fight. So we had to dissolve our business and that was kind of mm-hmm. the end of my entrepreneurial activities. After college, I went and worked for big corporate America and Mm -hmm. big healthcare companies like Medtronic, Baxter, Stryker, um, some of the biggest. And it was, it was great. I learned so much. I learned how to sell. I learned business. I learned marketing and met a phenomenal doctor who was really cutting edge as far as uh, diagnosing lung cancer at an earlier stage. And he wasn't doing anything, you know, that wild and crazy, except for it took a lot of work. And so he was able to identify these patients who potentially had lung cancer and then get them into a screening. I don't want to use the word screening. It's the wrong word, but get them into a follow-up program. And there was no software or technology to do this. So he had a bunch of staff helping him and it was cumbersome and it took a lot of time but he saw a good, a big stage shift in early stage detection. And so he said, I'm going to go start a business. Um, Why don't you come be my CEO? And I said, no way. Like I know nothing about being a CEO. Um, You know, the imposter syndrome kind of kicked in, like, who am I I as a sales rep? And um, he ended up hiring somebody else. And I joined the company about six months, seven months later, nine months, whatever it was. And I was vice president of business development, which was totally my ish. Like I knew how to sell. I knew how to grow. I knew how to get in front of people. I knew all of the things, but even that title as VP, I struggled with because I was like, I was just a sales rep yesterday and now I'm a VP of this company. And it was a small company, yeah. but regardless, like it was a really hard mental shift for me to wrap around. Like, did I deserve it? Like, how am I here? How come, what are people going to think? I used to care what people would think all the time Yeah, and just, you know, started to really do what I knew how to do. And that was sell and get in front of people and quickly realized that I was doing a lot of maybe what the CEO, you know, should have been doing. And so mm-hmm. we were able to move him out and then I came in as president and that was great. And um, we built this beautiful technology company that literally saves lives every single day. And they do it by um, analyzing reports from a CT scan or an X-ray or an MRI and finding these patients who might have cancer in the future, don't mm-hmm. have cancer today, but need to be followed. And we went from, you know, two employees to a bunch of employees and we ended up in the Inc. 5000 at 128 fastest growing company. Wow. It was just, it was just beautiful journey. Uh, my partner and I became co-CEOs in 2018 and 
survived COVID, grew the business during COVID, raised, you know, capital, raised a series A, did all of these really amazing things. Mm -hmm. And in 23, so I'll back up a little bit. I started going through the self um, growth awareness journey where I started learning about me. And it was the first time I had really sat back and, you know, kind of pondered, why am I the way I am? Um, I had thrown so much into the business. I had two small children uh, and I didn't feel like I had these close relationships. My now ex-husband and I were struggling to connect and to be, you know, bonded and I was missing my girlfriends. And yeah, so I started, yeah, I started figuring out why and, um, started unwinding a lot of these behaviors from my childhood, like, Mm -hmm. um, being a people pleaser and acting a certain way because I knew how to keep people happy. But what I was doing is I was sacrificing my own personal needs or wants or whatever to make other people happy. And so I didn't realize it, but I derived my value and my self-worth from other people. And so, you know, in 22, 23, or 22 really, um, made some hard decisions and my husband and I decided to separate the end of that Mm -hmm. year. So I moved out of our family home. And then four months later into 23, I made the really difficult decision to leave Eon. And it was heartbreaking for me because it was, you know, my third baby. And I had invested so much time and energy into this. But it was just one of those things when you have an inner impulse, this inner knowing that says, you know, it's time. And I was really trying to honor this newfound growth where I was listening to myself and I was honoring my needs. And so I made the really difficult decision and stepped away. So within four months, I went from being crazy busy as a co-CEO, meetings all day long, coming home with my children to only having my kids 50% of the time and no work. And so I was alone. Oh my gosh, I was alone. And you know, through difficult trying times, beautiful growth can occur when we allow it. And I would as much, as much pain as I felt during that time, I would never do anything different. And it was just such a magical moment. I went into a cocoon. I really didn't see anybody for six months and I just healed. I just worked on being present and being myself. And I remember asking my therapist, like, I feel really selfish He's like, you feel mm. selfish for healing? Mm. And I was like, wow, that was profound to hear it in that way. Yeah. So I started writing. I've always liked to write. I've always been a journaler. And through that, out poured this book. Um, it's called Unwinding Perfect. And it was released in April of this year of, of 24. And it's really my memoir to unwind these childhood conditionings and generational patterns, these behaviors I had learned from my parents at a very young age on how to survive in a chaotic family. I was the youngest of four. My siblings were all half siblings. So they were all from, you know, divorced families. And it was before there were resources and research about how to emotional, you know, the emotional well-being of children. So it was just it was complicated. I didn't know it. I was always loved. I always felt loved. I always gave love, but I just learned to behave and survive in this environment. And so my memoir is just, you know, my journey to unwind some of those behaviors to learn how to choose myself and put myself first. So that book came out and then I thought I would do kind of the speaker circuit and the author circuit. And I enjoy it. I love doing podcasts. It's been really great. Um, but it's like, I miss being in the business world. I love business. I like operating business. I love being with teams. I love strategy. I love facilitating, you know, connections and growth and teamwork and outcomes. And so I I founded a small advisory boutique, a boutique advisory firm called co-found her. Mm -hmm. And through that, my goal is really to be, um, you know, the co-founder with these entrepreneurs and founders who are ready to take their business to the next level, but they're not really sure how. 
And I want to just kind of grab arms and go lockstep into growing their business in whatever fashion needs to get done. So that's, that's where I'm at today. I think that's so amazing. You know, one, to recognize, like you say, you had such a high level in your life. And I think a lot of times we all go through this point in our lives where we kind of begin to question, okay, is this really what I want? Because I, mm-hmm. I kind of went through that kind of thing, similar thing myself, where I was working in a particular um, field in tech and all this other stuff, and I was making a good salary, but was it, it wasn't truly what I wanted. You know what I mean? Because it does take up a lot of time. It takes a lot of time from family, from the things that you want to do. Yeah. And being able to recognize that, you know, let me ask you this question. I think, I feel like I'm 49. I feel like today's generation begin to recognize that self-worth, that self-discovery journey a lot earlier than I did. You know what I mean? Than my generation did, where it took us a little longer because as you said, those childhood um, things that are inbred in us is that you work a job until you retire. You show up every day. You know what I mean? Like, that's what you, you do. Put your head down. You put yes. up shit. How dare you try to go yeah. off and find yourself, right? Or heal mm-hmm. from something where, no, you you work. And I think today is so different now. Where they kind of leave with that thing of like, I want to know who I am and what I want. And it might not be this corporal way of living. It might be a different way. I might choose yeah. family first versus the job and the corporate and the career. Do yeah. you see that I, more I, today? I have chills all over my body because I think you, what you are saying is so spot on. We're, we're of the same generation where Mm -hmm. you, you put your head down and you don't ask questions and you just show up and you do the hard work and you don't have boundaries because you, it's more desirable to be productive and have that good salary than anything else. Yeah. I'll tell you my daughter, she's 13. She is the most self-aware human being. I know she came into this world with self-awareness, with boundaries, with this wisdom that it sounds like you and I were on the same path where it took us a long time to figure it out. And then having employees, you know, everybody would talk about, you know, certain generations and how hard they are to manage. And I would look at, you know, the early 20s somethings and be like, wow, they know, they know what matters. They're mission driven. They care deeply about their fellow people, race, sexuality, any of it. Like it's not, it was just, it's just a beautiful thing to see this, these next generations who are more wise. Now, I don't know what that means. I mean, for, you know, you hear the things about workplace, you know, like where somebody you know, feelings get hurt or whatever. And yeah. so then they quit, yeah. but whatever, like they'll, they're going to go figure it out. They're going to go yeah, to Costa Rica and work with monkeys or something, you know, like in the it, jungle or something like they're going to do something totally different and that's okay. God. Yeah. Yeah. You do hear a lot about that workplace sensitivity. They feel like a lot of these younger kids are a lot more sensitive than we mm-hmm. were a lot stronger. We took a lot more. So I do see a lot of that. Um, let me ask you this too. What type of confidence did it take for you to say, I'm going to step away from this one confidence. And then what kind of fears came into play also when you decided to step away from this somewhat secure job, right? This career you built, this company you helped build to go off and do something different. That's really unknown to you to do. How did you, what was the confidence and the fears that took place in that? I will say there, there was not a lot of confidence to be totally frank. It was, there's a lot of fear. Um, As someone who wasn't raised or didn't grow up with trusting my gut always and choosing myself. I mean, I remember when I left Eon, my dad said, Oh, I'm so sorry that you're hurting. And I'm like, I'm not hurting. Like, you know, like it it was scary, but his whole mindset was like, stick it out, you know, whatever it was, that's what you do. And it's like, no, you, you know, like I'm choosing myself. It just, it was so foreign to everybody. So it was foreign to me. So a lot of fears, my identity was wrapped up in being co-CEO, you know, of a technology, healthcare technology company. And that was, that was challenging too, because who am I? Like, who am I without that title? Right. Like 
that was hard. And I, I fortunately had started doing some self-help work around that six months prior to, and maybe 10 months prior to, not knowing that I might make this decision to leave, but just unraveling this identity of this co-CEO of this technology company, because there's some ego that comes with that. And yeah. yep. I, you know, it's like, but that's not who I am. You strip that away. Like, who am I really? And I, what I really want to be is a kind person. I want to mm-hmm. inspire people to step into this life that they desire and they deserve. I, I want to help people grow. You know, I want to give back. And that's yeah. who I am at my core. It's not because I've reached a certain level or a certain status. Um, so, yeah. So as far as confidence, I look back now and I think it was a pretty courageous yeah. move to make, but yeah, I didn't it's... feel that at the time. It was all, I was very scared. I didn't know what I was going to do. Mm-hmm. I really, my faith in God, universe, divine, you know, however you define it had really grown in the past several years. And so I just put a lot of faith and just prayed every day, you know, surrendered and said, I I know you've got me. Like, let's figure, you know, like, show me the path, show me the breadcrumbs. And I just kept taking these little breadcrumbs and I picked them up and I allowed myself to rest when I needed to rest. And I pushed when I needed to push. And I think for me, that has now given me confidence to know whatever I do going forward, I'm held, I'm safe, I'm going to be okay. Even if I fail, that's okay. Yeah. Like, Failure is a huge lesson and a huge crop growth opportunity too. Yeah. And and that's the right attitude to have towards it. I think a lot of people look at fear as, a, as an end of things versus an opportunity to grow and learn. And you touched on something that was so important too, because I experienced this as well, is that who am I without the job title? You know, mm-hmm. and, and that is really serious. And I don't think enough of us talk about that because people really do get attached to the job title. And when they don't have yeah. it, it's almost like they just don't know who they are. And that question has to come into play where it's like, well, who am I now? Who am I now without this job title, without this big salary that I was receiving? You know, who am I and how am I going to do this and how am I going to make this work? So how did you manage it? Please. I'm going to flip it on you. How did you manage that transition? It was, God, I, I, you know, I feel like I had to do some self-work as well because I had to say to myself that I'm more than just this title and this is not really what I want for myself. I don't want to work myself to death and just wait till I turn 60 or, you know, 50, 65 to retire. I want right. more out of life. I want to reclaim some of the time I've spent and reclaim some of the time I've lost. And so I decided to just kind of, strip away from it because people always do me as, you know, I'm in tech, I'm in product. I was a leader in that space too. Mm-hmm. And it was hard. It was hard. You know, sometimes I still go through a little withdrawals with that. Totally. I do. I yeah. still do. But I try to pray my way through it as well. Right. And just have faith to know that I'm just going to take steps regardless, no matter what. No matter what it looks like, no matter what I see around me, I'm going to walk in faith regardless and just know that there's light at the end of this tunnel, you know, mm-hmm. and still my path. So I'm still pushing through that. So I have to encourage myself every day when it comes to it. Would you say though that the light in the tunnel is brighter now than yeah. Yes. It is yeah. it's so much more rewarding. You know, so much more freeing too when you're mm, able freedom. to freedom. Yeah, to step away because you're you're very restricted. You know, when you're in a position, like you said, and you're required to be at a place, you're restricted. And so that's why I do this conversation, which was going to be refreshing. You know, I just Mm. knew it was. Thank you. Um, Thank you. When it comes to co-founded her, um, you talk about holistic success. And so kind of tell me what can you elaborate a little bit on that and what that means to you and how do you help others achieve it? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, one thing I was. pretty like ignorant towards were everybody's special and unique gifts. I yeah. mean, it seems so obvious. Like once, once you have these aha moments, it's very obvious, but I just thought everybody operated the way that I did. I didn't understand that things were easy to me were actually my gifts. And so when other people couldn't do them, 
or I didn't mm-hmm. understand why they weren't, I had to realize, oh, it's just not as easy or natural for them. And same thing, like there are things that I am awful at, I refuse to do because it's hard and challenging. And that just means it's not yeah. my gift. It's other people make it look so easy and so seamless. So one of my natural skills is to be able to look at uh, a business, a situation, and just kind of know what needs to get done to understand, all right, you know, we're trying to reach X growth, or you're trying to reach this certain group of people, or you're having this product problem. Like I have the ability to understand how to bring the right people together or how to get to that end point. And so (laughs) I think when an entrepreneur or a founder is stuck, I can come in and help them become unstuck and see what that answer is. And I'm just... One of my skills is being able to just get things done. I, I just figure it out. I know how to get it done. I move forward. I don't second guess myself. Um, and that served me really well early on in Eon. And yeah. I know that it's going to serve other founders. Sometimes you just need a partner. I mean, yeah, my ex-business partner and I, we would, we collaborated and talked about everything. And so just having that ear where you're able to talk with somebody and bounce ideas off of and maybe look at things differently than you had been is where I think I'll be able to bring a lot of value to these companies. Yeah. Yeah. I think so too. Are you, is it that you come in before they actually launch a product or launch it to market or do you work with companies who are already in market and kind of just need that person to still help them scale or maybe even just bounce those ideas off of? And I would say any, but where my sweet spot really is, is, um, post revenue, it doesn't have to be a lot of revenue, but some it has demonstrated some type of product market fit yeah. and then being able to see, okay, here's the right channels, the right pathways. Here's the structure to help grow this business, to take it to that next level. Um, you know, I've worked in billion dollar businesses, but I was just a tiny little, you know, yeah. I was just a salesperson there. So I don't have the experience at that level. But Mm -hmm. I do have experience taking a SaaS business from nothing to something, you know, that's pretty substantial. Um, And so that's where I think that I could just really bring that value. Yeah. You know, I think all CEO, I think when we're starting out and with business, we tend to think that we can do it all ourselves. You know, that we, we tend to think we can do it all ourselves. We don't understand the value of having other people having a team, you know, and putting out, paying out for services that we know we actually need. And Mm -hmm. so I feel like, did you ever run into those clients that maybe felt like, well, I think I'm, I'm pretty good. I could do this on my own. You know what I mean? I've gotten this far. Always. You know, always. And it's like another person comes in and give you this perspective. It's like a light bulb goes off. Mm -hmm. So I know you had to deal with some of those clients. All the clients, you know, even myself, where yeah. I thought I could do it, you know, there were times we, we would call it expensive tuition. You would yeah. think you're doing the right thing and you'd invest time, money, energy, whatever into it. And then only to find out that there was probably a better, easier, faster way to do it yeah. if we had just gone a different route. But that's how you learn too. And that's, that's mm-hmm. the experiential experience. That's the experiential wisdom that I have now that I can share with others when they're at a certain stage of their business and ready to move forward. Yeah. And that's, that's what I feel too. Cause like I said, I feel like entrepreneurship can be such a solo journey. It could be a road of just you, you know what I mean? And being able to find community, being able to find people who can help you get to that next level or help you grow your business. is something I think we all need to invest in. Um, I want to go back for a minute. When you started your entrepreneur journey, you said, you know, it's very young, of course. <laughs> and mm-hmm. did you, once that ended, did you, did you think you would ever end up in entrepreneurship? Or did you think when you um, sign on to Eon that, okay, this is it. I'm going to ride this out. This is what I'm going to do because you loved it so much. Did you ever see yourself back in entrepreneurship? It's, so that's uh, it's such a funny question because yes, like I always thought that I was going to be this entrepreneur. I thought I'd take over my dad's business or I would, you know, okay. out of college, start my own thing. And then, you know, life just has a funny way of interfering. And I yeah. actually, my first job out of college was with Enterprise Rent-A-Car because I was moving to Los Angeles and everybody worked for Enterprise Rent-A-Car. They only hired college graduates, you know, <laughs> 
it was this, it, when it, it turned out to be the, like the most amazing job ever. I talk about it all the time because I learned to run a PNL, like to manage a PNL, to run a business, mm-hmm. to have a team. Um, it's just so much that I learned. And then I just kind of got stuck, not stuck, but just kept moving into corporate America. I just kept mm-hmm. climbing that corporate ladder that when you look at now, it you know takes years and years and years. But if you're able to start a company or get in early with a company, you can leapfrog those mm-hmm. years and get a whole nother set of experience that you just, mm-hmm. you can't get in corporate America. I mean, I mentioned I worked for these billion dollar companies, but I knew nothing about the operations of it. Yeah. You, you, that's way outside my skill set, just because I hadn't, I don't have exposure to that or experience with that. You know, um, I wanted to ask you, was there a pivotal moment for you that took place that made you finally make that decision to take that leap and say, you know what, I'm going to leave this and go out on my own. Was there a pivotal moment for you or was it a a collection of things that kind of took place? To leave Eon and go out on my own or to leave Corporate America and go to Eon? To just to leave Eon and go out on your own. Was there a a pivotal moment for you that took place that said it's time? Yeah. So, um, you know, I came in in 2015 and my business partner and I, it was the two of us and our dev team and we grew the business and we were excellent business partners and loved every minute of it. And as we started to raise capital and it grew, we always knew that co-CEOs, that we were hoping co-CEOs would work. Yes. Our investors would say, you know, no co CEO ship ever really works indefinitely. Yes. Like at some point, it's going to become a single CEO. And we just got to the point where we had all this capital, and I had one way I wanted to deploy it. He had another way. Mm. And we'd always had really healthy conflict, um, you know, and that's what gave us a, an advantage because we were able to stay ahead of everything because we had these competing ideas. But it just got to the point where it's like, okay, this isn't necessarily what's best for the business anymore. And it's time yeah. to have a single CEO. We have a ton of employees. We had a wonderful clients. Like it, they deserve to have a single CEO at that point. And we went back and forth with different structure. I would be CEO. I'd be COO. He'd be CEO. You know, all of these things. And ultimately, it just, you know, you asked, like, I just had that inner knowing that, okay, it's time for me to go do something else. And I didn't know what it was. And I didn't know that I had as much healing that I needed to do. I just, I didn't know that. I just knew it was time for me to move on to my next chapter. And so I trusted that gut instead of the fear of, I'm not going to be co-CEO. What if I don't have a salary? All the things that have been chirping at me that were conditioned to, you know, put our heads down and not listen to, I just said, you know, that I'm going to have this fear, but I'm going to do it anyways. Yeah. Yeah. That was good. Step out on fear anyway. Um, <sighs> when you decided to write Unwinding Perfect, what was the, mo- well, you kind of gave us the motivation behind it, but did you see yourself as an author before? And if so, my second question to that is also, was Unwinding Perfect part of your healing journey for you by being able to kind of get it all out and put it in a book form? Yeah. So yes to all. Um, I, when, so I read a book called the Buddha and the badass by, uh, I can't think of his last name right now. I don't have it up there. Uh, and back in 2020 maybe. And I saw how he used his book as a marketing tool for the company. And I'd always like to write. So I was like, oh, I'm going to write a book about healthcare and all the bureaucracy in it and all these things. And it will be really a marketing tool for Eon. And so I had this whole plan to write this book. And then I never put the time or energy into it because it required a lot. And so I guess in the back of my head, I kind of knew I was going to write a book at some point. But when I started writing after I separated from my husband and left Eon, it was cathartic. It was healing mm-hmm. for me. It was a way for me to get a lot out. And then I had a friend or two who urged me, they're like, this is good. Like you should write a book. And so then yeah. it just poured out of me and became a book. And 
I just said to the universe, I was like, if I'm supposed to put this book out, give me a sign. And no joke, like two days later, I got an email that said, have you ever wanted to write your first book? Come meet best-selling author and publisher, <laughs> Samantha Joy. And I was like, oh, okay. Like that's a sign. I'm for sure. <laughs> that, that's a sign. That's so That's amazing. Yeah, what made you choose the book name on Wine and Perfect? What made you choose that? You know, it's so funny. I didn't have a book name and I was in that first session with Samantha Joy and she was uh -huh. talking about being an author and the process. And, and it just came to me in the middle of that session where it's like, oh my gosh, I've been unwinding this persona for, mm -hmm. you know, this past year or whatever, however long. And I'd always presented perfect. Everything had to be perfect. Like I, I didn't know who I was. And so I, I, I hid that by having this facade of mm -hmm. everything's perfect. I have a perfect husband. I have a perfect family. I have the perfect job. I, you know, yeah. all the perfect things. And I just realized I was sick of it. I didn't want to that facade anymore. And so I was sitting in there in that, that meeting and I was like unwinding perfect. I went online, I bought the domain right then. <laughs> and, and I didn't waver from it. Like that's the name that just stuck. So, and I think a lot of people relate to it. I think a lot oh, of people yeah. say, oh yeah, I get that. Oh yeah. That perfect lifestyle, that perfect life that we all believe we have. And you're right. It is a really good name for it. Um, I know you're a big advocate about embracing one's true self. What mm. advice would you give to um, individuals struggling with their own societal pressures or a perfectionism mm. to pursue their success? Oh, um, what I um, would say is don't be afraid to look at your shadows. Yeah. Don't be afraid of your shadows and don't, don't be afraid to start exposing your shadows. So for me, I think the shadow work was some of the scariest and the hardest, but also the most rewarding. And once I started looking at my shadows and embracing them instead of trying to hide them or be mad at them or feeling shame or all of the emotions that come with them. And yeah. I could say, you know what I see you like, I love you no matter what. I love you regardless of that maybe negative behavior. They just kind of started to melt away. And so it's hard work. It requires self-reflection. It requires being dedicated to it. And you're going to feel a little bit of pain. You're going to feel a little bit of hurt, but it's so rewarding. And that's yeah. when you can start to have that freedom that you talked about where you're breaking free from those corporate chains or those other things that are holding you hostage. Oh yeah. Yeah. That is so true. You know, a lot of people talk about that shadow work. I was thinking about doing it, but it does, it does scare me a little because oh. how people talk about it, but it's something I'm very interested in doing. So I think I might go ahead and take that leap and do it. I feel like you've already like started to dig into it though. Just you, you seem like you have a lot of self-awareness and yeah. you know, like I'm, you, I'm you might, you know <laughs> yeah, I, I just, for me, it's been so beautiful and mm -hmm. what's on the other end of it is just, it's indescribable. I mean, it's just, I feel like I'm a totally different person and I'm, confident in a way that I've never been before. And I don't care what anybody thinks about me anymore mm. because I fully accept me. Like I accept me. Mm. And as long as I've got me, then I'm good. That is so true. I'm going to bring the show to a, a close, but I want to ask you maybe one or two more questions. Looking ahead, what are your future goals for co-found her and also your personal journey? You know, I, um, I just really want to make an impact. I want my legacy to be where I've really helped people step into the fullest and best version of themselves. I thought that I had to, because, because I found myself working 80 hours a week and I found myself in this position as co-CEO that I needed to stay away from business and not get into that. But the reality is, is that's what I love and that's what I'm good at. So I want to be able to be on that journey with others with, with while still having boundaries and not putting myself in the same position that I did before. Um, so that's really the goal of that. And then 
you know, I, I have four and five years left with my kids in the house yeah. and I really missed a lot of their childhood. And I just want to be present. I want to laugh with them. I mean, we've laughed more in the past six months than I have probably laughed in the past four years. And I just, I think that's so great for me. It's great for them. Yeah. Uh, so that's, I mean, that's really, and they don't want to hang out with me anymore. I mean, they're teenagers, but when they do, <laughs> you know, I want to be there and I want to make sure I can say, yep, let's go or, you know, whatever it is. Um, so yes, that's, that's what I just, I just want love and light and laughter. Those three things, oh. love, light and laughter. Oh yeah. And, and you know what? I think that's a great way, great way to end this show because love, light and laughter should be the things that Oof. we all see when it happens. Yeah. Everything else. Good. Yeah. Thank mm-hmm. you. It's been great. I could talk to you forever. So thank you for having me. Oh, thank you so much, Christina. This has been such an enlightening episode, you know, and just being able to talk about your journey and the path that you're on, a lot of the great things that you're currently doing. Um, it's inspiring. And thank I you. just appreciate you taking the time and coming on the show and being able to inspire our listeners as well. Yeah. Well, likewise, thank you for having me. It's great to know yes. you. You too. All right, guys. I am Shawnee Sanders. This is the Girl Techno Podcast, and I will talk to you next time. 